Hey everybody, it is Liz and we are bringing up Moji and we are bringing up Marie right now. Uh, welcome to day three of Netroots Nation, the morning dump as hosted by your three-headed hydra of the Feminist Sleeper Cell podcast. Um, so great. Hi guys. Hey. <laughs> so we like to kick off each of our episodes with a little inspiration from somebody who has um, inspired us to do the work we do and not in a good way. Um, today we are going to be hitting some quick hits and we are gonna really be covering um, what the anti-abortion movement looks like, how it intersects with movements and issues that you might be working on, and also how terrifyingly influential they are legislatively. So without further ado, I think it's important to kick off your Saturday morning with the leader of formerly Operation Rescue, not Operation Save America, the one and only Reverend Pastor Rusty Thomas. Ooh, let's start it again so we can get some uh, volume on that. Oh, we're, we're here. We're just going to get some volume on Rusty. We have... Be marginalized. Good godly men, they're not invited to the party in the United States of America. They're going to be ignored. They're going to be dismissed. They're going to be marginalized and considered fringe in that nation. And while the true men are marginalized, what replaces it? Well, the culmination, now look, look at your generation now, look at your generation, children will be their oppressors. So whenever a nation exchanges patriarchy for feminism, you are going deeper and deeper into the curse of God upon your nation. How about consciously and deliberately train young men to be leaders a time like this demands? Because if that's God's solution, then how about we prepare for this? Do you know who's fueling the Black Lives Matter? Listen, white, progressive, Marxist young women. Women will rule over you. When it comes to this abortion holocaust, one of my main prayers is, oh God, turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. And by the way, this is unpopular. I know it because we want to pretend abortion is a woman's issue. It is not a woman's issue. It is a man's issue. Pray tell, why is that so? Because the one that God has ordained to protect and provide for women and children are men. Do you understand what abortion does to manhood? Yeah. Do you understand what abortion does to manhood? It is practically a castratrix. <laughs> you have an abortion and it's literally, it's kind of like in It's a Wonderful Life. Every time in a woman has an abortion, an angel gets castrated. I think that's what happens. An angel loses his nads. Well, for sure, a member of Operation Save America is castrated uh, every time. <laughs> every time. Every single time. So, um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the world we live in, to Rusty, the Rusty Jones Hour. Um, I'm Liz Winstead, again, with your incredible host, who I introduced earlier, Moji Alawadal. Hey. Marie Khan. We are the Abortion Access Force podcast, Feminist Sleeper Cell. If you don't listen to us, we have a weekly podcast where we just break down the garbage news in, in abortion, in reproductive rights, health, and justice. And we also sometimes bring good news. So that's really good. So Rusty Thomas, um, always good to open. I really want people to hear, and it sets us up nicely because he hit so many intersections right there, right? He hit abortion, he hit um, BLM, he hit, um, you know, misogyny, he hit 
all uh, a couple Holocaust, of the Holocaust. The Holocaust, yes. I mean, he hit misogyny real hard. He just like yeah. went in. He's like, these women, they're coming for you. Yeah, he he does. It's they're they're definitely uh, as we call them an intersectional hate group. Yeah, an intersectional hate group. You know, you give a woman an inch, she'll fucking take all, all the things. Your whole, your whole um, thing. Or just maybe just expose your um, profound mediocrity. I like how he really centered men in abortion. That was exciting. That's always exciting to hear. I really feel like when <laughs> cis men take it upon themselves to um, actually talk about masculinity um, and how when a woman just asserts or a person just asserts themselves in a decision they make that it um, strips away the, you know, just like acid rain coming down on masculinity, you know, it's just like, <sighs> and then um, men are just apparently, um, dare I say, snowflakes? Ooh, what a wild concept. <laughs> <laughs> for the amount of time that we're called snowflakes for trying to call out hypocrisy or cruelty or call in people who might actually um, hear if you actually talk to them about it. Um, they seem to have their, um, what are those things called? H hankle, ha hackles? <laughs> <laughs> about it and get very defensive in their own skin. I feel like they're not comfortable in their own skin. And I just, the details too with which they have of everything that they can't stand, I just can't get over it. They seem to be experts at stuff that, um, that I thought I was smart about, like being a woman. <laughs> they seem to I know. I feel like we treated uh, Netroots attendees to like a minute or so of what was like an hour long speech. <laughs> like, and oh. it was more of the same. <laughs> more of the same. And we'll get to more of that. And we're going to show you um, some other short clips of leadership from, um, from this national convention. That speech, just FYI, it was dated, but it happened two and a half weeks ago. It's not <laughs> like from the 50s. It's from two and a half weeks ago to a national gathering of people that they are rallying around to take on, um, take up arms, which is terrifying. So we'll talk more about that with our amazing guest we have coming up, Robin Marty, who is a journalist. She is an activist. She is my go-to human on all things factual around the issue of access to abortion, what's going on in legislation, she just knows everything, and we're so glad to have her. And she also is going to talk about her new job, which I'm not going to introduce here. I'm not, we'll talk about that, which is super, super cool. But, you know, before we do all that, we love to just dive into um, the news of the day, what is happening as the world is burning um, all around us. Um, there's actually really important news that is burning and isn't getting coverage. So we're going to do that. Marie, you want to kick it off? Yes, one of the things we wanted to highlight that we were really excited about um, at the end of late May, the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, worked to partner with a couple other states, organizations requesting, hey, it's COVID. Why is it the folks still have to show up to a clinic, to a center of abortion care to get the abortion pill? In the United States, you can utilize that pill for 10 weeks or less of a gestation point in a pregnancy, but you have to go to an office to get it. It's heavily restricted. There are um, regulations put in place by the Food and Drug Administration that do this and treat this medication like you would treat other types of, of highly controlled substances for folks in other situations, folks who are working with addiction, who have other medical contexts and situations. Why do you ask is the abortion pill here? Because of politics, because of people blocking access to reproductive care. So thankfully, a judge listened to the ACLU, a judge out of Maryland, and um, that judge said, Judge Chang, hey, you know what? It's COVID. This presents an undue burden. I'm going to lift this and allow folks, hopefully, the ability to get at this abortion pill easier. We were excited. We talked about this in the feminist sleeper cell. And of course, nine states, led by Texas and Indiana, are trying to block the injunction that, was, that is designed to allow folks in some states to get better access to that pill. So that fight is going on right now. And it's just, it's... It's mind boggling. It's still COVID, 
it's even when it's not COVID, it's horrifically difficult to get an abortion, regardless at what point you're at gestationally. And and these these folks, these nine states and other politicians, folks just like um, OSA that are out there, pretend politicians legislating our uteruses, other folks' bodies are saying, nope, you don't, you don't get to do this. Well, and I would say, you know, it's in our advocacy, it's always so fascinating. It's so on every single piece of what is happening around reproductive care is so underreported that like folks don't even understand that there are, there, that a medication abortion exists. Like folks don't even understand that you can take super safe pills, you know, that were introduced, you know, back in the 90s, bless France, um, you know, um, it's a two pill regimen, you can have it up to 10 weeks right now legally. Um, it is been, but the second it came and the second it was like, oh, wait, this is going to make abortion care easier, more private, give the patient who needs the abortion control over how their abortion goes immediately every the, the antis had to have a stake in making it bad somehow um and so they gave it this crazy classification that means that the only way you can distribute it is through a doctor in person like like medications that are like super addictive or for other reasons you need to be supervised to do it and what I find so interesting about this injunction, just like so many other things around abortion regulations, it's like, you can't say sometimes it's safe and sometimes it's not. So even though we have a pandemic and it took a pandemic to kick off somebody to say, just like every other piece of telemedicine that we are examining and allowing for folks, this should also be, why wasn't it before? How did it get this classification to begin with? And it's because I think we don't have larger groups of people advocating for full and 100% autonomy over your own medical care. Also, yeah. I think what we talked about, we touched on this yesterday and we touched on it a lot, but it's also just about the blaming and shaming uh, pregnant people, right? It's like, oh, this could be really simple and, and easy and you could manage it yourself, but we would like to add extra levels of complications, which it's it's wild that like, yeah, the the, the judge said, oh no, there's no reason to do this. And these these states are coming in like, no, 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 we need it to stay complicated. This is very important to us. Yes. And also we and, and we need it to stay, stay complicated and we should not talk about it very much so that we can't have healthy, smart conversations around what does safe managed care look like and that it exists with the narrative that we, um, which was a rightful narrative when people were trying to access abortion when it was illegal and there wasn't safe ways to manage your abortion. You know, that's why it's like when we talk about hangers and we talk about this stuff, you don't want to be muddying up the waters of what self-managed abortion is versus what unsafe abortion without information because people were desperate in, in and and still often are in in inaccessible places but having conversations it's just so so important and i think like people don't even know simple things like that an abortion with a pill is a miscarriage like it's the same effect um nobody in the medical field would know the difference if you went in for a checkup if you took medication abortion people wouldn't know unless you told them that you had a medication abortion. Like there's really real things, how safe it is, um, you know, and, and I just feel like it makes me feel just really sad that we aren't having these safety conversations and putting ownership of our own health care um, into the hands of the people who need it. Exactly. I, I'm really glad you brought up a miscarriage because that was a that was a carve out right even when when the when it became available or you know the judge ruled that it should become available there was still this carve out like for abortion not for miscarriage which also doesn't really make any sense but that was that's another sort of exception that was thrown in there and i'm not a lawyer i don't know why and another interesting part of this too if anyone's wondering well wait like 
how, how do we change FDA policy? Federal Health and Human Services Department oversees the FDA. And who appoints the head of Health and Human Services? The President of the United States. Or the governor. So, or, or the, exactly, or the state. governor. So we, who you elect in those roles dictates who they, who's, who's gonna get to pick the head of Health and Human Services. And that trickles down to the very prescriptions people that are watching this need, the very medical care people need. And I just say too, like it can't be stressed enough when we talk about um, all of these obstacles that come up around abortion. We talk legislatively so much, but the regulatory things that happen that people didn't vote on, that bodies like HHS come into being that do, um, it's really incredible. And I was really, when we were talking, we talked a little bit about yesterday and we did a really expansive piece on it at Netroots last year, but in examining what the Department of Health and Human Services and, and what that umbrella is, um, I was, my eyes were opened. You know, I did not realize that, for example, the kids in cages policy was developed by an anti-abortion extremist who was put into this, um, this department um, of refugee resettlement, which is under Health and Human Services. And so the person that was setting up the kids in cages came from the anti-abortion movement, had no experience in children, in resettlement or refugees, just was literally an anti-abortion zealot that got placed in. And so it was, um, it's interesting to find out that all the things that are under Health and Human Services that like I literally had no idea and how when they can just create a regulation, it can get put title 10, yep. title 10, how that gets regulated. You know, like a lot of stuff can be um, it changed just by having sanity within um, the health and human services, you know, and as we look at our COVID response and the department of health and human services, um, and you can just kind of see it playing out in real time, what happens when incompetence reigns supreme. Um, it's kind of a mess. So yeah, so um, it's very exciting. And hopefully it's a situation where if we as people who um, have seen this happen and, and states are allowing telemedicine on some level to happen with abortion provision, hopefully it is you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Like you can't just say, oh, we're gonna go back to not having it without a reason other than, are you putting us at risk or are you not? Because if you're not, then let's just keep this door open, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What else you got, Marie? I think we're gonna be make um, Robin very happy with this next story. Yes, so we have, Emoji, feel free to jump in here. I poor Marie. <laughs> we abortion funds, clinics are near and dear to our heart. And we are really, really excited that the Yellowhammer Fund down in Alabama uh, a couple of weeks ago announced the purchase of an abortion clinic there, the West Alabama Women's Center in Tuscaloosa. And very recently, they just announced also the amazing news that Dr. Uh, Leah Torres is going to be coming in to head up that clinic. Yeah, and I want to say um, a couple weeks ago on our podcast, we interviewed um, the new executive director of the West Alabama uh, Women's Center, um, Lori Bertram Ross, and um, incredible. The interview is so good. She is so full of life and so amazing, and it's really great to just listen to the journey of activists who started an abortion fund that wanted to really expand what it means to fund reproductive care. Um, we talk a lot on this podcast. We talk a lot. We've talked at Netroots about um, the true path forward is to honor and fund all pregnancy outcomes. If we want to say that we are a country that truly believes in somebody's space and care, it means you fund all pregnancy outcomes. You are excited and want to help them if they need help carrying a pregnancy and raising that child in a safe and healthy environment. And you gladly will fund somebody who has decided that that pregnancy and, and having a child is not the right time for them. So um, it's very exciting to, and Leah Torres has got an incredible Twitter handle. She's incredible on Twitter, must, 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 must follow. Comes, um, has been somebody who has dedicated her life to providing abortion in spaces that are, um, are, are, are hostile to abortion in Utah, now going to Alabama. It's pretty darn cool. 
It's yeah. really exciting because this comes at the heel of Alabama passing the most restrictive law ever. And I think when we had our conversation with the executive director, they pointed out that actually the fund wasn't doing great, but because of this restrictive, restrictive law, donations poured in and it gave them the funds to really push the fund forward to buying a clinic. So this is super exciting. And I have to say, I'm really excited. And um, let's bring, um, we'll bring Robin on in, in, in a button when we wrap this. Um, but I just want to say, too, it was very exciting to have developed relationships um, and traveled to Alabama. We've been to Alabama four times, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, um, Huntsville, Bir Birmingham. Um, and to be able to develop relationships with these really incredible activists who were working so hard and to remind people that in places like Alabama, like you see such true intersectionality. You see people who are doing the work of prison reform, LGBTQ work, you know, just like, you know, working on healthcare for trans folks, like unionizing, like people were doing all this work. And so when Alabama happened and there was like well-meaning people who were like, oh my God, this is happening, give to Planned Parenthood. And it's like, there's not a Planned Parenthood in Alabama. What you need to do is donate to this abortion fund. And so to be able to help push that narrative forward, for Yellowhammer, um, because we had developed those relationships, um, is the is the reason that we do this work, and it's the reason that everybody needs to get to know when you are doing whatever discipline you are focused on. Please figure out a way to know who you are working with, because media. If we rely on media, the go-to people are generalists. They're never the people who are actually on the ground doing the work, or very rarely. And so, to be able to get to know them, you're actually a doing that one-to-one -one activism right away and you are able to direct people to the people who are doing 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 the work and i and i just feel super good about that so without further ado let's bring on our guest marie do you want to give this drum roll intro to our friend yes we are so so excited to bring in robin marty yay welcome here Robin is, um, in addition to being a journalist and the author of um, several books on abortion, the latest being The End of Roe, Inside the Rights to Destroy Legal Abortion, she is the comms director of the West Alabama Women's Center. Robin, hello! Oh, so actually this whole thing has been kind of wonderful because it is popping into my head that, Liz, we met almost exactly five years ago and we met in Alabama. Yes. Because you were down and it was when Rusty and Operation Save America had decided that they were going to come try and see if they could shut down all the clinics in Alabama with their terror and their prayer and everything there. And so like, I still have these wonderful pictures of Liz in front of the powerhouse in Montgomery, Alabama, just chilling out and basically giving the finger to all these anti-abortion activists. And that... That was how we met. And so it's a little bit lovely right now to see us all like coming back full circle, talking about Alabama, sitting here five years later and how much everything has changed for everybody and in a lot of ways for the country since then. Yeah, for sure. And it was, um, to me, it was like that particular trip was we went to Mississippi and then we went to Alabama and we had, we had a good chunk of time to spend with people on the ground. And, you know, it was super rewarding to be able to bring food to the folks at the powerhouse, which was next door to the clinic in Montgomery while they were doing their work and organizing. And, and to really understand so often, like, you know, I'm a Northern person, I'm from Minnesota, I live in Brooklyn, you know, to really learn and see folks who are fighting a battle in states that people write off. I'll never forget Mia Raven, who was at the powerhouse and running the powerhouse activist down there who's great um, called me and said, can you just do anything? Because Doug Jones can win if people know Doug Jones can win. Can you just like, and I said, well, why don't you come on our podcast? I don't know how many people we have, but like, you know, she was so, and that's when I was like, listen to the people on the ground. They will tell you, you know? And then I think we started shaming the DNC you know, be like, support this person. Um, he can win. And Mia was right. And Doug Jones won. And she's like, no one understood. You know, it was just great. So I'm so happy you're here. Robin, 
And it's one of the things that's so frustrating now being like deeply embedded in, so we're calling our region the Deep South because we are dealing primarily with the Gulf Coast, we're dealing with Mississippi. Um, Yellowhammer over the last year has really like reached out across doing the work in Mississippi, um, New, Louisiana in general, especially because clinics had been ha struggling so much with everything that it was going on with June V. Gee. Um, and then over into the Florida Panhandle where there really isn't any care until you get all the way over to the east side, uh, except for one really bad clinic that we try not to send people to because yes, we have standards. Um, so the problem is when people like, people, the broader people look at how to invest in resources in the South, they think to themselves, okay, Texas is turning purple. I want to make sure that Texas has the resources to do their political work. Georgia is turning purple. I want to make sure Georgia has the resources to do political work. But they look at Mississippi and they look at Alabama and they say, we don't think anything can change there. So there's no point in building a movement. And so that's where we had to come in and just make the movement from scratch ourselves. So it's not just about abortion. And it's why we have so many intersectionalities going on, because we have to do the Black Lives Matters work. We have to do the prison reform work. We have to, we haven't even expanded Medicaid yet in Alabama. Those are all the things that we have to be doing together. And so this is how we can build our own power from the ground up since nobody wants to help us. Well, also it's so, um, I'm gonna use the word gross because I'm from Minnesota, but it's so it. gross that the epicenter of the civil rights movement that you say that with Northerners are like, you know what? I don't know if we should do anything in Alabama because can we really make change? And it's like, yeah, bitch, did you? <laughs> did you miss the 60s? <laughs> uh, all that, like, uh, yeah, you know, and it's very, yeah. Also the Civil Rights Museum in Montgomery, Alabama is, one of the most, I'm telling everyone, if you are looking for, after COVID, if you are looking for an enriching trip, you can go to the Civil Rights Museum, you can go to the Rosa Parks Museum, and bonus, the Hank Williams Museum. If you like old country music, it is fantastic. So, and you just, it's such a rich, Alabama's a rich tradition. And if you don't know that after the passing of John Lewis and the many documentaries, and things, then I can't help you. But one like- of the things that's really heartbreaking is a lot of, so with Yellowhammer over the last year, one of the things that we've worked really hard on is making sure that we have mutual support for other organizations in the ground in the state. And one of our biggest partner organizations is called TKO Society. It's the Knights and Orchids. And so we're working with them in Selma and in Huntsville. It's a black trans led group. Um, they're basically organizing around black trans teams, but it's black led, trans led. And this is what we call the black belt down there. So it is the absolute poorest area that you can live in in the south and we're talking uh, like destitution and so being able to help them recently we just helped them to do a fundraiser so that they could have an organizing center um, we provide support for them so that they can get food out to the community um, medical care medical supplies all of these other things this is selma this is like the epicenter of where we say that human rights all human rights matter and people just ignore it yeah. yeah, which brings us to let's, which brings us to um, when you ignore it, who then gets to um, create the narrative, put the power, um, affect the vulnerable, especially, you know, when you look at white folks who are looking for somebody to um, lay blame to all things that are happening and those blames lay onto women and any anybody on a gender spectrum black people brown people everybody right so takes us to why it's i will never stop sort of trying to get progressives into a room to talk about organizations that lead with anti-abortion extremism but also are influencing um so much of the policy around um, anti-trans work, anti-LGBTQ work, the COVID hoax bullshit, like these are all behind it. And Robin, you have been a student forever of, of these organizations and these movements, and I always go to you. So I, I'm wondering if you could 
give our folks just a little bit of a history of just to kick off Operation Save America and um, and where their power lies, and then we'll kind of branch off into other um, anti-abortion organizations that also have power that people should be looking at. Sure. So I'm going to do like high level because you just basically asked for three days worth of. I know. <laughs> I asked for a seminar. I tell you about Operation <laughs> Save America. So, but I'm just going to do a high level um, look at how the anti-abortion movement started in general. Um, and for people who are really interested in this, what really got me into this subject was a book called um, Wrath of Angels, and it was by Judy Rison, and I forget the name, oh, Judy Thomas and somebody Rison, but anyway, Wrath of Angels, it's kind of hard to get right now, but it is an amazing book that takes you from just before Roe to about the FACE Act, and it covers the anti-abortion movement, and I will tell you this, I talked to Troy Newman, and he sat down for multiple, multiple interviews with this Explain woman. Explain who he is. Um, uh, yes, Troy Newman, when we start talking about Operation Rescue schisms, Troy Newman is currently in charge of Operation Rescue. Um, but Troy Newman actually said, this is a writer who was not horrible. And so the fact that he called her not horrible means that it actually did a fairly good job of representing what was going on um, in their opinion. So that's, that's really high quality to them. Um, so when the anti-abortion movement started, and it started before Roe v. Wade, obviously, because as abortion started to become something that people wanted to make legal, the church groups, primarily the Catholic Church, were already organizing and especially organizing in states to make sure that that didn't happen. They didn't win, obviously. That all turned into what is now known as national right to life. National Right to Life was brought in from the Catholic Church, and it's the overall organization that allowed people to organize in their local churches. And so that's why you have all these different versions of state right to life. Then you had the next big group, which was um, Pro-Life Action League. And Pro-Life Action League was trying to organize people to close clinics. That's where you got ideas like um, people would call it clinics over and over again in the 80s so that nobody could get in on the phone lines. Um, Joe Scheidler, who ran Pro-Life Action Network, had a book that was called 99 Ways to Stop Abortion. And most of it was like terrorist tactics of go slip into their meetings and then follow abortion doctors home, all that sort of fun stuff. Joe Scheidler in about in the late 80s had a man named John Ryan come to one of his conferences and John Ryan said, you know, I'm in Missouri in St. Louis and I've been sitting in front of, of abortion clinics and blocking the way to get into abortion clinics. This is something that we should do. And there was this other man who was there kind of playing the piano and brought along for fun and his name was Randall Terry. Oh God. And Harry said, hey, this sounds like a really great idea. Maybe more of us should do this. And hence, Operation Rescue was born. So Operation Rescue was born in the late 80s with Randall Terry and became a nationwide organization. There was Operation Rescue West, Operation Rescue East, Operation Rescue North, South, Texas, etc. And everybody all kind of coordinated together with Pro-Life Action Network, who also had all of these state organizations. And it became known as the Pro-Life Action Pro-Life Action League. The Pro-Life Action League, no, I'm sorry. Pro-Life Action League is Joe Scheidler. It became known as the Pro-Life Action Network. That is what ended up getting sued by the National Organization of Women and abortion clinics across the country because they were in a RICO lawsuit where they said, obviously these places are collaborating together across multiple states to try and close down clinics. You got the rescue movement, you got people chaining themselves to doors. When this lawsuit happened, um, basically Operation Rescue broke up. Everybody had to break up and go into their own organizations and say that they weren't talking to each other because that was how they were breaking up the RICO suit so that nobody could sue them. So you have Operation Rescue with Randall Terry who got progressively more and more whoa um, and all of these other little Operation Rescue groups ended up saying that they were no longer Operation Rescue and they announced themselves as new groups like survivors of the abortion holocaust down in California or um, Abolish human abortion. Um, yeah, they kind of spun out of it, but they're not entirely. But eventually what you ended up with was Operation Rescue West, um, Operation Rescue national and that was what was run by 
our good friend Flip Benham. Um, Flip ended up getting into, basically everybody got into a fight. Um, Troy Newman decided that he wanted to have the name Operation Rescue, so he stole the name Operation Rescue. Everybody got mad. Um, Operation Rescue National turned into Operation Save America, and that's how you got Operation Save America, who then birthed all these little anti-abortion um, babies, and they became Abolish Human Abortion. So that was the big upper level. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. That's it's good. Like, if you've ever seen the gif of the guy with the post-it notes and the lines everywhere, that's basically anti-abortion history. It's, and it so I, a while. Like, yeah. one, someday when I have a house that's not tiny house, I'm going to actually have a wall where I get to trace everybody and it's going to be glorious. And, 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 be and also, um, I wanted to just tap Robin also briefly into, um, that these organizations, especially Operation Save America, also are really tipping their toes into a lot of other hate mongering lanes. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the Islamophobia that they focus on, how they have been horrible in the LGBTQ community. And we have a clip talking from um, Matt Truella in a minute that we'll roll in to talk about um, this militia COVID shit that they're involved in as well. Yeah, so when Operation Rescue became Operation National, which is when Flip Benham took over, they eventually started to change their name into Operation Save America because they were branching out from just abortion. Um, this was the late 90s, early 2000s, and their biggest thing that they got into was they were really, <laughs> they hated the gays, and so they really hated Disney. Disney was like this huge, yeah, Disney. Disney's super bad. Like Ellen. Disney's all sexy time, all yeah. the gay all time. Well. time. Really? Um, yeah, but also there Man was, and buoyant tea kettles running around. Like what <laughs> they started, they started they started giving um benefits to gay partners. Oh, oh, yeah. And so it turned into this huge thing. Um, so that's where Operation Save America, as it was Operation National, like really got into the headlines because they started picketing Disney World. Um, and then there was this like weird, I'll explain why I know this. Um, there was this weird thing that went on for a while where Disney was doing hometown parades where they would pick these small towns across the United States and they would host like the Disney style parade that happens at Disney World through their town. And so Operation Rescue would organize against this in order to um, like, they would jump into the parades and have these, you are all homosexuals who are going to going to hell. Like they would jump into these and they would organize them. And the man who was helping to organize them, and I'm blanking on his name, and I swear I'm going to send out a link as soon as this is over, but you can find this all in a Mother Jones article and look up Mary, Mary, oh, the Equity Forward. Look up the Equity Forward woman who I'm blanking on right Mary now. Mary Alice. Car Newman. Yeah, Carter. No, Mary, Mary Alice. I'm, anyway, Mary Alice. Look up Mary Alice and Mother. Mary Alice Carter. Thank you, Anna Bean. There. And, and Disney. And so the guy that was helping to organize all of this is now in the Health and Human Services Department. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yep. So <laughs> Scott something and I'm and I'm blanking on his name because I had stopped researching him and then you know, we found 50 people in yeah. Health and Human Services in our research. Scott Lloyd, thank thank you, Kat. Yes, Scott Lloyd got his start with Operation oh. Rescue. Oh, Scott Lloyd, our boyfriend. Save America. Yeah. Um, basically organizing anti-Disney parades or organizing GLBT, anti-GLBT stuff into Disney parades in Wisconsin in the late 90s, early 2000s. He got arrested at Disney all the time. It's really weird. Um, but Just a so sidebar, when I was at The Daily Show and that was happening, um, we walked through the Disney store and all we did was identify every Disney toy as either a dildo or a butt plug. And we just walked through the whole thing being like, Dildo, blood plug, blood plug, dildo, princess. And, and then they finally threw us out of the store. Um, but, um, not before we got everything on tape, because that's how you childishly deal with um, a giant I issue. I'm never going to look at a Disney thing the same. And I'm very, very glad that my kids have outgrown that stage. Thank you. Um, this is not a family show, y'all. No, it's not a family show. But um, I think that that's like, 
It's so important and to watch Flip Benham, who you mentioned, who is still out in front of the clinic in Charlotte every okay. week. Somebody who prides himself. I highly recommend watching AKA Jane Rowe. It's really interesting to find out that Flip Benham in the in that crew was, you know, funding Norma McCorvey's fake um, transformation um, to anti-Christian, anti or pro-Christian, anti-abortion extremists baptized her. But he prides himself on burning Qurans. Oh, don't say pride. <laughs> yeah. And just taking on the trans bathroom um, things oh, in yeah. a way that it's just so hideous, speaking before city councils. And um, when we were in taking on Operation Save America last summer, um, they were planning a massive hit at um, Drag Queen Story Hour, which is this incredible, um, I've seen Drag Queen Story Hours in several different cities, and it's just this amazing story hour to introduce kids to trans people and folks that are doing drag and have this really joyful experience um, in a kid's hour and they were out there promoting it. And so, um, so yeah. Um, so, yeah, so they're we anti, did, they're right. anti gay, they're anti trans. As you mentioned, they like to burn Qurans because they think that that's fabulous. And one of the things that is really, we were talking about how this all transfers into politics and how this transfers into um, what you see on the ground. They are a group that is really good. Like nobody's ever gonna elect a AHA member into Congress. Knock on wood, maybe hopefully. Um, but the way that they work locally is really powerful because they will get people into city councils. They will start to pressure people in school boards. They will like in Oklahoma. They're going over and over again. I think they actually managed to get somebody who did a. Uh, I know they were trying to get somebody who would say that abortion was homicide and that Rosen Silk was right. holding state so, office and he's yeah. running for Congress right now. Right. And so what people don't understand is that big picture, maybe they won't get into a place where you can, where they will be making hopefully state wide decisions or country wide decisions, hopefully, but all you need is somebody who can control a city council and you can shut down an abortion clinic. All if you have people who are like we saw in Indiana with Whole Women's Health, um, when they were trying to open their clinic that was just going to do medication abortion, um, the fact that the city council kept stalling them over and over and over again and would not let them have the license that they needed in, I think it took close to two and a half years before Amy was able to actually open that clinic because cities have so much power when it comes to access to an abortion clinic. They can make it so that you can't get zoning. They can make it so that people can can be too close to your clinic. They can make it so that um, you can't get a noise ordinance. Like they can say how much activity happens in front of this. And so we have to pay attention to the fact that these are super, super, super fringy. And a lot of times people look at them and say, oh, well, nobody is ever going to fall for that. It's too fringy. But you only need in cities of power to have one or two people in a place and they can overturn everything. And That's right. And I think they're fully aware of it. When we watched their, their conference of two weeks ago, they had full trainings, like this is what you can do in your city, in your state, to put the things that we find important into either, if not state law, at least like practically how they work in the state. And they also had elected officials. You have Matt Shea out of Washington State, you know, in the Spokane area and, and in, um, Moose Lake area, and, and you have Joseph Silk, who we talked about. Um, you have a, a person in Arkansas, the person that has been pushing the bill in Arkansas, a state yeah. rep who also owns a church. You know, And so in places, the state of Wisconsin um, are, has a very influential group of Operation Save America people who lobby regularly. Um, and I'm, we're gonna show you a clip of Matt in a second. Um, in fact, why don't we pull Matt up and then we'll tell you a little bit about the conference that you saw the clip from Rusty earlier. We're going to play this Matt Truella clip and then we're going to tell you about the action that we do um, around these gatherings. So this is one of the leaders in, in, in Operation Save America who lives in Wisconsin. We are in a war at this point and you must step forward and confront the tyrants. Face masks are the trademark of sheep, citizen Gestapo, 
and tyrants. I refuse to wear one. I will not shop at places that demand I wear one. And I will not only not shop while they demand it, I will never shop there ever again. Take the Jews, for example. It didn't happen that just one day, boxcars showed up and they told all the Jews to meet over by the railroad station and told them, hey, jump on. You're all heading off to the death camps. There's always a thousand accommodations to tyranny before you get to the final solution. This is absolute evil, absolute wickedness. It should not be tolerated for a minute. And it's all happening because we've forgotten God and our nation is being turned into hell because of it. But that doesn't mean we should just sit back and say, isn't this interesting while we eat popcorn? The American people have been indifferent and compliant with every evil that has come down the pike. They have been indifferent and compliant with the slaughter of the preborn, the actual murder of little human beings. They have been indifferent and compliant with homosex being decriminalized and sodomite marriage being legalized. They have been indifferent and compliant with the decriminalization of adultery and the proliferation of pornography. They have been indifferent and compliant with every evil that has come along, which impugns the law and word of God. You now are in the crosshairs. This nation is breaking apart. It will break apart. There's nothing redeemable here. There's no sense in trying to keep the union together. Put a security plan together for your home. There is huge evil afoot here. That's because the standard is this for true Christianity. If the state commands that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we're to obey God rather than man. Our text Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That should break your heart. We are that nation that's being turned into hell. Get in. So we know that was a long clip, but it was worth it because um, when I met Robin, and she, when we opened with this conversation, um, the Operation Save America people have an annual conference that they hold in a city or a state every year. Uh, they choose that state for various reasons. They, um, they are uh, gather in hundreds, sometimes near a thousand groups of people. They um, are outside the abortion clinics with those horrible signs. They um, go to the, the seat of state government with, uh, and have a massive rally and service talking about their doctrine of lesser magistrates, which means if laws are made that um, go against what they believe the laws of God are, that they have permission to disobey those laws, i.e. Roe v. Wade, i.e. protecting abortion providers, i.e. giving them permission for violence. Um, they are invited and have been invited. Last year when we went to counter protest them in, in Wisconsin, we followed them to Madison, they were invited to lobby state legislators and state senators in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Oklahoma, in Indiana. And those are just the states that I'm remembering right now where I have been to counter them, Kentucky as well. Um, they have been invited to lobby. They are helping craft legislation. They are not on the sidelines. They are very much in, in, um, in it and you don't know them. And so it's super important for us. We have twice now gone um, in person, brought part of our funding and part of what we do is to bring people and help pay for them to come and counter them, not outside of the clinics, because that's just immeasurably hard for the clinics and for patients to understand the cacophony, but because they spend a week in a town in public parks at, at, um, at the state capitals, we go and do this. Um, and it's been very rewarding. So we want to grow that when we are post COVID, but this year they did it all online. And what was fascinating, both of the clips you saw are from their gathering that was at the end of July. And the thing that we really want you to join with us, go to operate, it's osaunmasked.com or operationsaveamerica.com because they forgot to renew their domain name and we bought it, whoops. Um, but to go and, 
to have um, entry into their um, seminars and their meetings was something that was a first time for us. I know Robin has been in as a journalist and has been invited to hear some of it, but um, <laughs> we're usually outside protesting. So be able to really learn and understand what they stand for, how they organize and what they're doing was eye opening. And we have many clips on the website, many things that you can do, but we'd love for you to, it's an ongoing website that was sort of bore out of that action, but we realized that it's a good home for people to go and learn as they say things and do things and make their plans. We are able to go there and say, we have an action planned. Do you want to find out more in your community and bring people together because they are influencing your world and it's real. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's what we do. And then we met Robin and we've met a lot of activists that way and really helping people on the ground when these people are in their space and being able to say, we can support you is crucial in this. If we are not working together, they are winning. I'm going to, I'm going to be that person and I'm going to plug myself for a second. Yes, please. Not in a Disney sort of way. Um, but <laughs> thank you. Um, so I wrote a book at one point. Um, it's called Handbook for post row America, and it came out, God, I don't know, a year ago, two years yeah, ago? 18 actually, months, uh, to be specific. What? 18 months, months, to be specific. Okay, so it feels like it came out two or three years ago. Yeah. Um, but it is actually, I'm in the process, literally, at this moment of rewriting it, um, because in just those 18 months, or two years, it was that I wrote the last draft. It, everything has, whoo. Um, and so one of the things that is being built up in this new, in this new version is a lot more action that people can take. We've redone the entire thing to update it and add a lot more information, but we're also doing checklists at the end of each chapter that gives you an action plan that you can take that will allow you to decide, like, um, if you're going to seek out an abortion, what are all the things that you need to do? If you are going to have a self-medicated abortion at home, what are the things you need to do? If you're going to try and do civil disobedience, what are all the things that you need to do? And one of the chapter lists that the end of chapter lists is how to counter protest a protest. Um, because it is very important that you do not counter protesters at an abortion clinic. Absolutely not, because to a patient, every person in front of a clinic is somebody who is trying to scare them away from getting care. They don't care if you're supportive, if you're not supportive, um, unless you've been invited by a clinic to help a person get into that clinic, stay away from there. But there are so many places that you can go and not actually impede somebody's right to care. Um, for example, just throwing this out here, but at this literal minute, probably, um, there is a protest happening right in front of our wonderful clinic at West Alabama Women's Center. Um, we asked everybody to stay away because they are holding a press conference and they just do their thing. We're letting them do their thing there, but they are also having a prayer picnic later at a park. Um, and we told people that if they wanted to go over there and do something, that's a great place to go do something. Um, the local state senator from Tuscaloosa, which is where the clinic is, is at the clinic as part of the press conference. Don't protest the press conference. But, you know, he happens to have a church. If people felt like they needed to go to his church and tell him that he shouldn't be interfering with people's decisions, there's nothing wrong with that. So there That's are a big action we promote. Yes. Although not right now, because social distancing, unless you can figure out how to do it socially yep. distant. Yep. But when the book comes out, and it's coming out on March 2nd, um, when it comes back again, it's the like all new handbook for Pro Store America or something like that. You'll know it because it's blue instead of red. Otherwise, same thing. Um, when that book comes out, it will have lots of ways that people can, and it actually features the Abortion Access Front and Abortion Access Force to make sure that people know that this is a place where you can go in order to get all sorts of tips. And Michelle and Kristen helped me helped me come up with ways that things that you need to know in order to be safe when you're protesting a protest. So awesome. thank you to your people. That is awesome. So um, we are going to quickly wrap up. Where's one question that I'm going to answer and then just, um, and do that. And then we have to wrap up because we only have um, seven minutes left. But um, um, Victoria is asked what anti-abortion groups across the U.S. are quietly emerging. Um, I think what we'll do, Victoria, is put in the comments 
um, some of those organizations so you can find out about them and find out um, where they are um, and how you can do to squash them. Also, if you want to um, literally email, uh, sign up for our email list. We um, are always having actions and always helping find ways. I don't know where you live, but we can connect you with folks on the ground who are doing that work. And we have, and that's one thing that's really good about us is that we can be connectors so that we can help uplift the people doing the work on the ground because that's what we love to do. So that is for you to know that. And then Cynthia asks, what about DNA tracking to hold the men who impregnated the women accountable? That seems like a slippery slope around people's civil liberties. Um, so I would say let's not track anyone's DNA, but let's just make sure that um, men understand, um, cis men who want to drop their seed into another person, you have just given up the right to that nine-tenths of the law. Don't put your junk in my yard because then it's mine. That is my <laughs> what I'm saying um, <laughs> in all of that. I think it's pretty straightforward. You know what? What are you going to do? It's, it's mine now. I get to do what I want with it. You put it into my body. It's my body. Whatever happens to it. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so that is what um, I have to say about that. Thank you for the questions. Thank you so much. We like to close out our show with a really fun segment. And Robin's going to stay on because she loves this segment. Um, we close out every one of our podcasts and every one of our networks with a little segment we call uh, six degrees of abortion, very much like the Kevin Bacon game. But what happens is Marie and Moji pick a news story unrelated to abortion. And then I have six chances to try to tie it to abortion. Um, but I have my friend Robin here and we're going to work on this together when we hear the news story. So Marie, Moji, what is the story you're going to try to stump us with? So... This seemed like such a good idea when Marie and I were discussing it yesterday, but now- Yesterday, this morning at like 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Let's, let's be real. <laughs> yeah. Actually, as I was like putting it together, I was like, oh, this is shockingly easy and the both of you together, I'm just embarrassed that we didn't bring something a little harder, but here we go. A week or so ago, uh, the president of the United States um, told no. <laughs> a Fox business host, that he is going to follow um, a conspiracy theory about what is going on with US UFOs. And so it's been reported that the Pentagon is forming a UFO task force headed by uh, um, Secretary of Defense David Norquist, and it will be announced soon. So yeah, <laughs> I would like you guys in Six Degrees or Less to die. Robin, you can do one and then I'll do one. Let's see where we both go to it. To abortion. <laughs> I was going to go first with um, alien probes. And then I, obviously they'll be really good at that because we already know that they love doing like non-mandatory ultrasounds all over the place. So they've got lots of practice. Amazing. I'm going to go with, because we have one, one and a half minutes left. Um, if it's if it's if it's UFOs, that's a job for Space Force. Who runs Space Force? Mike Pence. <laughs> Who runs abortion? Mike Pence. <laughs> so um, that is where I went with it. Um, so two routes, two people. Sorry, kids, you didn't get us. Robin Marty, you have been a gem, and you are a national thank treasure you. for helping us with educating all around this issues. And thank you for the work you're doing. People can support Yellow Hammer Fund. People can support the West Alabama Women's Center. Find out all about them. It's incredible. We have to go, but I want to thank you on behalf of Moji and Marie and Netroots Nation, our fam at Netroots. Thank you for being so great. We love being here. We hopefully we will see you in a post-COVID world very soon. Until then, go to aafront.org, sign up, find out who we are, find out what we do. Listen to our podcast. It is the Feminist Sleeper Cell. Subscribe. All the places you can subscribe to podcasts. It's good. You get a download. I love you. They're going to kick us off. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>